Good morning. My name is Kenneth Ford, and it is an honor for me to welcome this extraordinary group of colleagues and guests to Columbia and to this historic space. Having been around here for over 50 years as medical student, faculty member, member of the University Senate, department vice chair, and now chair of our Trustees Health Sciences Committee, I have lived more than a little of the modern history that this exciting television series documents. And as we're going to hear from our distinguished panel today, the genomic revolution has brought us to a new threshold not of not only understanding, but also the promise of effective precision treatments for the many diseases we know as cancer. Now, as some of you may remember, I got to learn firsthand just how powerful television can be in educating people in our country about cancer and its prevention. I was privileged some years ago to work with Katie Carrick in promoting colon cancer awareness, and indeed, the Carrick effect with the Peabody that accompanied it established her effectiveness in media and in medical history. And it was in this very room nearly four years ago that Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee received his Pulitzer Prize for the brilliant sweeping history he told in The Emperor of All Maladies. That's why readers know him as an extraordinary medical historian and vivid storyteller. Starting a week from now, thanks to these acclaimed filmmakers, WETA and PBS, millions of viewers around the world will see and hear Sid in that role as well. Here at Columbia, we know him best as a researcher and clinician in hematology and oncology. So this morning's conversation, moderated by Dr. Steve Emerson, the head of our Herbert Irving Cancer Center, is going to focus on the future that Sid, his colleagues here, and our guests from two great peer academic institutions are together inventing in the care and cures for cancer. Let me point out that this is also the room where Ken Burns and Barack Goodman received the DuPont Columbia Awards for Excellence in Broadcasting. So on behalf of President Lee Bollinger and Columbia Health Sciences Dean Dr. Lee Goldman, let me welcome all of you. And most importantly, I welcome Katie Carrick back to Columbia and thank her for her extraordinary leadership of Stand Up to Cancer. This organization has made much vital research possible, both here at Columbia and around the nation. And of course, it has played a central role in bringing the emperor of all maladies to a national audience on public television in the weeks ahead. Katie, welcome. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Gosh, being with you, Ken, brings back so many wonderful memories of probes and propofol and all sorts of other things. And I know you've done tens of thousands of colonoscopies, but believe me, I'll never forget mine. And neither will much of the nation, apparently. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, this morning before such an impressive group of people. It's great to be here also a week from the broadcast of this very important documentary series on the story of cancer. It's a story that, unfortunately, is all too familiar to so many of us. Um, I lost my first husband, Jay Monahan, to colon cancer in 1998 when he was just 42 years old. Our daughters were six and two at the time. And three years later, pancreatic cancer took my oldest sister, Emily. And I'm sure many of you are here today because you have faced similar heartache in, in your life. But there is another side to the story of cancer. It's about scientific breakthroughs. It's about how our understanding of this disease has evolved and how brilliant researchers are utilizing that knowledge to save lives every day. I think today more than ever, the story of cancer is actually a story of hope. 
But sadly, the researchers on the front lines of this disease are too often lack the funding they sorely need to make meaningful progress towards new treatments. After focusing solely on colon cancer awareness, on raising money for colon cancer research, I thought colon cancer and colons in general are probably getting too much of my attention. There are so many other cancers that deserve money, that deserve research, that deserve resources. So in 2007, I teamed up with a group of eight other women in the entertainment industry to see how we could use the resources available to us to address the problem of scientists not getting the funding they deserve and need. We consulted leading physician and physician scientists, including Denny Slayman, who is with us today, about what it would take to speed up the process, process of getting new therapies to patients. The recommendations were simple. First, find the very best scientists working on the same problems at different institutions and get them to collaborate on teams. Secondly, fund those teams at a meaningful level. And lastly, hold those teams accountable for real results in terms of patient benefit benefits. So in 2008, we launched an initiative called Stand Up to Cancer to establish a new paradigm for how cancer research is conducted. Four star-studded telecasts across multiple network platforms later, we've now funded 13 research dream teams, 26 individual investigators who have out-of-the-box ideas. More than 800 scientists have collaborated through Stand Up to Cancer from 115 institutions all around the world. Altogether, they've launched, launched more than 120 clinical trials, enrolling over 5,200 patients. So those numbers translate into the, the simple fact that we are pressing the gas pedal on cancer research, and we're not going to stop until our scientists are able to produce effective, important, and meaningful new therapies. As I'd like to say, hell hath no fury like nine type A women frustrated by the seemingly slow pace of progress in cancer research. One of those women was Laura Ziskin, the legendary film producer who was the heart and soul of Stand Up to Cancer. Laura lived with breast cancer for seven years before it took her life in 2011. She had long dreamed of producing a documentary about cancer. And when she read the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, she knew she had found the perfect source. At Laura's urging, the Entertainment Industry Foundation obtained the TV and film rights to Sid's magnificent book for its Stand Up to Cancer initiative. I think it is thrilling to see Laura's dream realized by such a brilliant team of people. Sid, Ken, Pam Williams, Laura's longtime producing partner, and the Peabody winning director, Barrett Goodman. When we announced this project in 2013, Sid made a point that resonates in the film, and especially here at this institution of learning. We cannot sustain the current momentum in cancer research unless we inspire and engage a whole new generation of scientists willing to roll up their sleeves and get involved. So I'm thrilled to announce the Emperor Science Awards program, which will provide scholarships and mentorships with research scientists to students from disadvantaged high schools throughout the country, encouraging them to pursue careers in science and hopefully, fingers crossed, cancer research. The first group of scientists who have volunteered as mentors rep represent an array of institutions, organizations, and companies, including the Stony Brook University Cancer Center, Siemens, Bristol-Myers Squibb, the American Cancer Society, and our very own Sid Mukherjee. I'd also like to thank Genentech, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Novartis for funding 300 Emperor Science Awards over the next three years, 300 young minds that could go on to write the next chapters of this story and perhaps one day, God willing, the end. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the executive producer of this wonderful and compelling documentary. He is America's documentarian in chief who revolutionized the forum with his series on the Civil War and went on to tackle so many other seminal topics in American history. And now he's taken on 
thank you, Ken, the subject of cancer. And people, I think, will never look at it in quite the same way. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ken Burns. Good morning, uh, particularly in the hallowed halls of Columbia and its uh, adherence to journalism. It would be a mistake for me to bury the lead. The lead is that on Monday, starting Monday, March 30th, and continuing the 31st and April 1st, PBS across the country, thanks to WETA, my producing partner for the last 35 years, will broadcast a three-part, six-hour series uh, called Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies. It is based on Siddhartha Mukherjee's remarkable Pulitzer Prize uh, winning book. But I think for those of us engaged over the past four plus years in trying to bring this story uh, to national attention, there are some interesting and poignant backstories, uh, not the least of which is, as Katie suggested, that this was born in the sort of fiery passion of Laura Ziskin's mind and heart, and she brought us to the starting line and could not run the race with us. Uh, one of the people who delivered the story, the message of this film, Ed Herman, our narrator, uh, died of brain cancer uh, literally days after he finished the narration. And so, as so many in this room, indeed in this great city and this country, we our lives are touched by, and in this case, our film bracketed by death from this insidious disease. I come to you with a deep connection uh, to Columbia University. I was born uh, in 1953 when my parents uh, were living on Morningside Heights. My father was a graduate student uh, in anthropology at Columbia. My mother had a job at Kings County Hospital. She was trained in biology. She developed breast cancer almost immediately after my birth, and I watched uh, for the next 11 plus years as my mother slowly uh, decayed and died of breast cancer. Um, it was witnessed not only by myself, but my brother Rick, who is an alumnus of uh, Columbia University. We are connected to this great institution. My awareness and involvement of this project began with an extraordinary woman named Sharon Rockefeller, who's here, who was emerging uh, from her own life-threatening struggle uh, with cancer and had the opportunity as she was recuperating and struggling with treatments uh, to read uh, uh, hot off the presses Sid's remarkable book. Um, she asked me if I would do this. In fact, she ordered me to do it. And I had a full plate of films and could not do it, but after reading Sid's book and understanding the way in which my own mother's death had formed me and who I am now, telling histories, waking the dead, trying to have conversations with people who are no longer here, it became obviously clear that somehow I had to do this. I had an opportunity to meet Sid and begin a very long journey, but for us the real question was, how we would tell the story, how we would translate this magnificent work of literature, this magnificently complex history into television for a general audience. I knew that I had to find someone who would do the day-to-day -day producing and directing, and I fortunately knew uh, all of my folks in-house were busy, uh, but I knew of the work and had admired for many years the work of Barrett Goodman, and it was a few short decisions later that we entered into, all of us, this incredibly complex journey. We're used to, Barrick and I are, are used to telling history, sort of straight historical narratives. That's not easy to wake the dead, to make the past uh, come alive. But we realized for this film to be an accurate reflection of what Sid had attempted to do, he said to us, we need an executive summary of this disease. We need to know where we've been, we need to know where we are, we need to know where we're going. And that's not something we in this media culture get. We hear a nightly news report about this breakthrough or this setback or that this problem or this new drug and we have no way to collate and organize it into any uh, principle that allows us as lay people, let alone scientists, to go forward uh, with an understanding of this disease. If it is indeed, as Sid said, 
suggests the emperor of all maladies, then we are all its subjects and are obligated to be part of a resistance movement. But what will the facts be? So Barrick and I and our team of writers, particularly Jeff Ward, struggled with understanding that we would have to tell a complex narrative that would have a riveting history. This is, of course, one of the greatest, if not the most important, detective story uh, ever. Uh, that it would therefore require, in the course of that history, communicating complex scientific information to a lay audience, which required ways of understanding, of illustrating, that would transcend the normal narratives that we do. But we also had to anchor it in personal experiences. I am loath to say case studies because we are drawn to human experience. And quite often in the conversation about cancer, we have left the agency of the patient out of it. And we felt obligated to anchor this with stories of real human beings like you and like me who suffer, who relate, who lose, who gain, who are cured, who die uh, from this disease. And so for the last four years, we have embedded uh, ourselves in a couple of hospitals and other locations, become flies on the wall, and been privileged to witness that unique interaction uh, between caregivers and the patients and their families. And our film is essentially this mongrel collection of history and science and intimate uh, stories that we are extremely excited to share with you uh, beginning next week. Uh, now, the series is, as I said, um, uh, three episodes, six hours. So I've asked the guards to lock the doors. And um, we'll be out at a little bit after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I know that you're very anxious to see the whole thing. No, in fact, we have a short 10-minute clip just to wet your whistle. It's so completely unfair. You're parachuting down into a very critical point. I think it's important to understand a disease that has been with us as long as there have been us's in this planet. Um, is so very little has been known about it until the most recent times. By the 70s, the mid-70s, we were even unaware of the mechanisms that cause cancer. We were cutting it out blindly, we were poisoning it uh, randomly, we were radiating it without um, full understanding of even how it began. And so I thought we'd share with you uh, a, a brief clip uh, from a hugely important moment when the mechanisms of cancer uh, begin to reveal themselves to, at least in this case, uh, two extraordinary scientists. So I'll be back in two minutes to introduce Barrick. Cancer strikes nearly every living thing on this planet. It cannot be fully cured until we understand it. And to understand it, we may have to solve the most complex puzzle of all, the nature of life itself. The difficulty with handling cancer is that it's a cellular disease. It's a disease which is of a different type than any disease we've solved thus far. By the mid-1970s, scientists had made little progress towards solving the mystery of what causes cancer. We only knew three facts about cancer. The first fact was that viruses could cause cancer, but we also knew that chemicals could cause cancer. Now, what viruses and chemicals had to do with each other in causing cancer, we didn't know, but here were two independent causes. And then we had a clue that genes might be involved in causing cancer. These tiny structures seen under the microscope are called chromosomes. In each cell of the body is a fixed and constant number of these chromosomes, consisting of a fixed and orderly arrangement of genes. There were clues that it would involve genes, and there were clues that were largely ignored. First clue would be simply that a cancer cell gives rise to more cancer cells, which gives rise to more cancer cells. That doesn't happen unless there are genes involved. Clue two was that some cancers are inherited in a limited number of cases. That screams genes. So viruses, chemicals, genes, we couldn't figure that out. We believed in every one of them. But what the relationship was between these, we had no idea. 
the most important thing is that everyone thinks there has to be a resolution. So in other words, these three theories have to have a central explanation. It's sort of the grand unified theory of cancer. The final piece of the puzzle of carcinogenesis came from a West Coast lab at the University of California at San Francisco, run by a young virologist named Michael Bishop. When I arrived at UCSF in February 1968, there was no clear single theory about what makes a cancer cell. And in fact, uh, nothing all that tangible. Um, it, it was a black box. I was working on poliovirus at the time, and then I was introduced to the Rouse sarcoma virus of chickens and overnight became a cancer scientist. Bishop was soon joined in his lab by a young researcher named Harold Varmus. I was a young doc who had actually spent more time studying English literature than science. But I started talking with Mike, who had been trained much as I had as a, as a doc, and then had learned something about new technologies by working with poliovirus. The two of us realized we had the same objective in mind. It took about 10 minutes for me to recognize that he had you know, a laser-like intelligence and that we could work together and probably have a good time doing it. Together, Bishop and Varmus decided to tackle the riddle of carcinogenesis by studying the strange virus first found in chicken tumor cells, the Rouse sarcoma virus. The remarkable thing about this virus was that you could infect cells in a test tube, and then the next day, those cells would all be cancer cells. It was an extraordinary transformation and how that worked, how that happened, was absolute mystery. The nascent discipline of molecular biology was developing. And so for the first time, there were the experimental instruments with which one could attack this problem, look inside cancer cells, peer into the nuclei of these cells, and peer inside the genes that these cells carried in their DNA. The Ross sarcoma virus presented a rare opportunity to watch carcinogenesis up close. We weren't studying viruses as a cause of cancer. We were studying viruses as a way to find out how cancer arises, what's the mechanism of the disease. Viruses are usually very simple. This particular virus has only four genes, and we have tens of thousands of them. To understand how just four genes can give rise to cancer really simplified the problem immensely. Through a process of elimination, a few labs, including Bishop and Varmus's, zeroed in on one of the virus's genes. This virus that causes cancer has four genes, and they find that a closely related virus that doesn't cause cancer has three genes. And that's a very interesting difference. What's this extra gene? And then the evidence begins to mount. This gene, right, carried by the virus, the extra gene, can cause the cancer. It was called an oncogene a cancer-causing gene in the virus. And then we began to think about a puzzle, and the puzzle was, why does the virus have this cancer gene? This gene we called SARC, the only thing it does is to convert the cell to a cancerous state. So the cancer gene seemed almost superfluous. Well, if the virus doesn't actually need the gene, why, why does it have it? Where did it come from? Maybe, they thought, the cancer-causing gene did not originate in the virus at all. Maybe it originated in the chicken. To my astonishment, when we looked in normal chicken cells, we found something that resembled the SARC cancer gene in Rouse sarcoma virus. It was a riveting moment. Everybody expected that the SARC gene, the SARC oncogene, the cancer gene, was a natural resident within the genome of Rouse sarcoma virus. But in fact, the profound discovery they made was that Rouse sarcoma virus had actually stolen, had kidnapped that gene from the repertoire of normal genes that are normally stored in the genome of a normal chicken cell. If the SARC oncogene had actually descended from a normal gene in chickens, where else might it be found? We looked at ducks, we looked at emus and rheas, which are the most primitive birds living. And then eventually, by fiddling with the technology, we could show that it was even in humans. The fact that Sark existed in 
all organisms, not just in viruses, but in chicken and geese and in humans. That fact gave a very crucial clue because that meant that genes that are capable of causing cancer are already existing inside animal genomes. I mean, imagine how exciting that would have been. Now, all of a sudden, you begin to see through the darkness a glimpse of what the clear theory of cancer is. There are genes in your body that control normal cellular growth. And if you disrupt these genes, you essentially begin to unleash cancer. Finally, the mystery of carcinogenesis had a single explanation, the oncogene. The important thing is that the viral theory was not wrong. The environmental theory was not wrong. The heredity theory was not wrong. They were just insufficient. It was like the blind man and the elephant. They were catching parts of the whole. And then all of a sudden, if you stepped back, you saw the whole elephant. The discovery of the Sark oncogene by Bishop and Varmus electrified the field and would win them the Nobel Prize. In the years that followed, labs around the world discovered dozens of other genes simply awaiting a mutation to transform them into oncogenes. It is a discovery of great proportions. The idea that a gene can be switched on to produce abnormal proteins and thus cancer. It could mean that all things we associate with cancer, radiation, hereditary defects, chemicals, rare viruses, smoking, all work by touching the same trigger, the oncogene. I think for the first time there was a mechanistic explanation on why cancer was occurring. And it was a total revolution. The promise that perhaps if the oncogenes were responsible for the development of cancer, then if we were smart enough, we ought to be able to attack them and then return and cure the cancer. We all had a feeling that everything was about to change, that we were playing out the era of trial and error, of empiricism, and we were beginning to move to a new era of design, where we understood enough of the science about cancer that we could imagine the discovery and development of drugs that would selectively target what was wrong, what was different about a cancer cell than a normal cell. It was a very heady and hopeful time. But even in the midst of their euphoria, those who had discovered the oncogene were aware of the challenges that lay ahead. We have not slain our enemy, the cancer cell, Harold Varmus would say when he received the Nobel Prize. We have only seen our monster more clearly and in new ways, ways that reveal a cancer cell to be a distorted version of our normal selves. Minus the intimate stories of uh, individuals, uh, you can begin to apprehend uh, the complexity that faced us. All credit is due then to my colleague, Barrick Goodman, who was able to marshal the forces not only to embed documentary producers within the hospitals to record those intimate moments, which you will see when you see the entire film, but also to take the script from Jeff Ward, myself, David Blistein, and, and Barrick, and, and move this into the realm of possibility uh, with incredibly complex uh, archival research, animation, and interviews with the finest set of talking heads we've ever had in any film. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the author of our enterprise, Barrett Goodman. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be home. This is I went to the Columbia J School and, and had an absolutely transformative year there, set me on, on whatever course I'm on now, uh, so it's great to be back. Um, Ken, when Ken called me about two and a half years ago to be a part of this project, I have to admit a, some trepidation because I, I had to ask myself what would it be like to spend two and a half years on cancer, in, in, in cancer hospitals, talking about cancer, living with cancer. But to my surprise, the last two and a half years have been some of the most fun years I've ever spent uh, on any film. 
And I think that's largely because I discovered what many of you already know, which is that science is fun. Um, it is a wonderful, exciting human enterprise full of foibles and failures and guesswork and intuition and, and all of those things that we lay people don't usually associate with science. And um, getting to know some of the world's greatest minds uh, in, in this field especially uh, has been, you know, surprising, exhilarating, um, and you know, has made this whole journey a real pleasure. Um, I just want to take a second to introduce my colleagues over here, Jack Youngelson, Chris Durrance. Is Deborah here? Could you guys stand up? These are my co-directors on the film who... Uh, <laughs> who were extremely instrumental in everything we've done. Um, and anyway, so... Uh, I'm just so pleased that we can share this film with you and the rest of the world um, and hopefully encourage people to think about cancer differently. This is a moment of great optimism in the field. Great um, progress is uh, clearly coming and has been made already in understanding cancer and we are thrilled to be able to be a very small part of that, so thank you. My name is uh, Tom Maniatis, and I'm the uh, director of the new uh, cross-campus precision medicine initiative at Columbia. I spend most of my life uh, studying genes, isolating genes, uh, and I, I found that piece uh, we just uh, viewed uh, really transformational. It was a time uh, in the history of cancer when we suddenly realized that there was a way now to go forward. So we, we could, for the first time, understand what cancer was about. We could develop, we can understand mechanisms of the disease. We could develop drugs to treat the disease. These so-called uh, designer drugs, which are tailored to individual cancer types and to individuals, an example of the very essence of precision medicine, which is now moving forward in a very rapid fashion. As you will hear from the distinguished panel this morning, which includes Sid Murkajit, breathtaking progress is being made in the understanding and treatment of cancer. Sid will not only explain, as he does so eloquently in his book and film, the pioneering research of others, but his own work as a part of the university-wide precision medicine initiative. Sid is at the forefront of research and treatment of blood cancer called myodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. For the press and others here, you may remember uh, President's, President Obama's recent federal commitment to research in precision, precision medicine as a national priority and an event many of us attended recently at the White House. While this exciting initiative includes the potential for effective new treatments for many diseases, cancer is clearly the initial target. The strategy for precision medicine is to identify genes that cause cancer, to understand the function of the protein products which they encode, and to understand how mutant forms of proteins cause cancers and from that develop drugs to treat cancer. The research in this field is going to be, uh, on, be on, in progress at uh, many academic uh, medical centers across the nation. But let me mention just two, two quick notes about what we're doing here at Columbia and our peer institutions in New York. For us, precision medicine is a university-wide effort that includes not only our medical center and not only the basic sciences and biomedical engineering on the Morningside campus, but also humanities, data science, law, public policy, and other fields that are required to address big questions raised by the genomics revolution and to train the next generation of students who must be versed in all of these fields. And here in New York City, through the New York Genome Center, we are joined together with nearly a dozen other institutions in the shared capacity to form, perform DNA sequencing 
and manage big data activities that are at the core of this multi multidisciplinary initiative. And in fact, many of you may know that Harold Varmus, the person in the film, and the co-discoverer uh, co -discover of the oncogene has recently joined the New York Genome Center uh, as a means of uh, coordinating all of the cancer activities in the city of New York uh, through the New York Genome Center. There have been previous hopeful moments in the long history of this book that, the, that this book and film recount, but the technological advances in DNA sequencing technology and computer analyses place us at a new era of cancer research that is already producing major breakthroughs in the understanding and treatment of cancer. So let me turn this over now to Steve Emerson, the director of the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. Steve is a cancer physician and researcher who has the unique experience of serving as the president of Haverford College, a superb science-focused liberal arts college. I would also like to invite the panel to come up now and to take their seats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve Emerson, and uh, welcome to Columbia University. Uh, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce our panel today, who will share with us their excitement being on the front lines of research about where our field has been, where it is now, and where it is moving rapidly. Each one of the individuals here is playing a major role in that revolution and we'll ask them briefly to tell us what's most exciting about it and then take questions from uh, the press and the audience. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, Professor Sid Mukherjee, you've heard already in many forums and hoped we'll hear from again in person. Uh, Dr. Andrew Kung is uh, Chief of Pediatric Hematology Oncology. Uh, he's been witness to some of the most rapid advances uh, in cancer therapeutics in pediatrics. Next is Dr. Corey Abadi Shen, who will tell us some of the most exciting advances in systems approaches to understanding cancer cells and how uh, uh, cancer is uh, initiated and can be treated. Next is Dr. Uh, Bill Nelson from Johns Hopkins, uh, who uh, leads one of our nation's major cancer centers. It's been the site of many advances in immunology. Uh, and in cancer genetics that it's very uh, most fundamental. Uh, next is Dr. Gary Schwartz. He's the Chief of Medical Oncology and Hematology here at Columbia. He is what's one of the first practitioners of personalized medicine, uh, precision medicine uh, at its very outset, now leads our programs here at Columbia. He's also been witness to some of the most important advances in immunotherapy, which we'll hear about in some detail. And finally, Dr. Dennis Slayman from UCLA. Uh, who's been involved in every aspect of this field, including the initiation of the Stand Up to Cancer uh, Consortium. And he'll tell us a bit about um, some of the biggest impacts of precision therapy. Uh, so with that introduction, let's start. Uh, first, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, the film's about the history of uh, cancer and research. Uh, it takes us up to almost the present. Can you tell us a bit about uh, your own work, where you stand in this field, what you see as the key issues, and what your contributions have been and may be in the future? Um, thank you, Steve, um, for that lovely introduction. And, and um, just before I start, let me thank uh, Ken and Barrack and Katie, Sharon, Tom, Ken, for bringing this amazing piece of work into the world. Thank you. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we do. I was born intellectually uh, when uh, cancer genetics was also being born. The idea that genes resident in normal cells 
could be mutated and thereby unleash a process that would ultimately lead to cancer. So that was my, so sort of my intellectual baptism. And, um, and the question that our laboratory has asked that I'm interested in is what, how do we take that information and make something of it? What do we do next? Um, how, does, how do these alterations in genes ultimately result in alterations in cellular behavior? Because ultimately cancer is something that happens beyond genes. How do these alter cellular behavior so that these behaviors result in a cell that grows out of control, invades other tissues, and ultimately leads to all the morbidity and mortality of cancer? Um, so we started, uh, we started with blood cancers because uh, it's what we perhaps understand the best. I treat patients with leukemia and pre-leukemic disease called MDS. We bring those samples into the laboratory. But really, our work begins when we try to understand how these cells survive in the human body. Uh, one of the most exciting projects that we've done, which was published in uh, Nature two years, three years ago, um, was when we found that, in fact, these blood cancer cells don't live in isolation. They live, they make their own homes. They make their environments up. Uh, they live in the bone marrow for a very specific reason, because they're getting signals that sustain their development within the bone marrow. And the question is, you know, instead of the traditional chemo chemotherapies, which try to attack the cancer cells directly, could we change the environment, could we change the home uh, in which these cells live so that now we can direct other kinds of therapies which may be less susceptible to the fact that cancer mutates all the time. You know, in cancer, you're playing this nasty evolutionary game trying to play cat and mouse because the cancer cell is evolving all the time. But instead of playing cat and mouse, can we, can we change the environment in which the cancer cells can eradicate the homes so that they, don't know, that they no longer can, can, can keep one step ahead? That's one area of research. Um, and the second that I'll mention uh, more recently is that we focus more and more on the cell biology of cancer. Again, how do these genes coordinate their lives so that the cancer cell acquires, uh, acquires this behavior? Um, and that has resulted in a new set of discoveries of um, stem cells that play roles in, in various forms of cancer. Um, the most exciting thing that's come out of that uh, uh, exactly about a month ago is that we actually, through the lens of cancer, were able to find normal stem cells, including a stem cell that seems to build the entire vertebrate skeleton, a skeletal stem cell. This was published in Cell uh, uh, two months ago, but really gives us a window uh, about what this environment is that causes cancer growth. You know, how does the bone get created so that the bone marrow that then gets created? And again, we're looking at cancer now, not only from the genetic level, but from the cell biological level. So those are two highlights uh, of, of the work we do, MDS, uh, and the work on bone and bone cancers. Um, but I'll let the rest of the panel speak about it further. Thank you, Sid. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Kung, you've been involved in uh, your work in pediatric oncology for quite a while and have seen both the progress in the field till now and where it's going. Can you tell us a bit about this and in particular, uh, based upon where we are now, how mm -hmm. the new genetics are impacting your work in diagnosis and treatment of cancers today. Absolutely. So in pediatric oncology, the uh, st modern story of therapies really starts with the hallmark uh, publication by Dr. Sidney Farber. This was uh, a publication in 1948 where he was able to show that the first chemotherapy agent identified aminopterin was able to briefly induce a reduction in leukemia in kids with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Since that time, the subsequent 65 years, the outcomes in kids with acute lymphoblastic leukemia has steadily improved to the point now where of all kids who present to us with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, 90% of kids are now cured of their disease. And so the narrative now is actually quite different, where instead of talking about brief remissions, our measure of success is really cure. Cure meaning forever. Now, if you take all kids who come in with cancer, currently the success rate is at 80%. We cure 80% of all kids that um, come in with cancer. That success. I think is a strong counter narrative to those who would argue that we're losing the war against cancer. The kind of success that has been demonstrated through the years really has been built upon research, research that has taught us 
that cancer is not one disease, but it is hundreds of different diseases. It's built on research that has taught us that the way that we treat cancer must be to combine different drugs then act in different ways to target the cancer cells. And it's predicated on research that has taught us that one size doesn't fit all, that individuals that present to us with cancer must be treated in a way that's tailored to their individual disease. And these are the precepts, I think, that underlie this modern concept of precision medicine. In our own division, as we treat our patients, we are now at a point where every patient that we treat, we actually fully sequence every gene in their body and every gene in their cancer. That's 25,000 genes. And we use that information currently in our clinical practice. And what this has allowed us to do is start chipping away at the remaining 20%, because we're not satisfied to be at 80% cure. We want to chip away and get to 100%. And so precision medicine in the future, I think, in pediatric oncology, will allow us not only to do better in terms of outcome for those 20% that we currently uh, don't cure, but also I think it will allow us to approach the 80% that we do cure and start trying to decrease some of the toxicities that are associated incumbent with our current treatments. And so I think this is a very exciting time for us in pediatric oncology where we've reached a certain level of success and with the evolution and the revolution of the precision medicine era, I think we can do much better, much better both in terms of outcome but also in, in terms of decreasing toxicity for those that we cure. Thanks, Andy. Um, now, since we don't want to be uh, at the mercy of the seven very angry uh, women uh, who want to know why cancers haven't yet been cured. Dr. Slayman, can you give us a sense of where this genomic revolution is impacting diagnosis and treatment of adult cancers? I think it's, it's clearly made an impact on some cancers that we were previously treating with what has already been said by Andrew um, just a few decades ago by a one-size-fits-all approach. One of the things the whole revolution has changed is we thought of these cancers monolithically by the organ in which they arose. So colon cancer was a disease, lung cancer was a disease, breast cancer was a disease. Perhaps we should have known uh, by virtue of the fact that as physicians, uh, it's one of those moments where you hit yourself on the forehead and say, why didn't I think of this before? Patients were having very different outcomes with these one-size-fits-all approaches. Um, and that wasn't due to good luck or bad luck, good doctor, bad luck doctor. That was due to the fact that they had a different spectrum of diseases. That as you saw in the wonderful piece that Ken and Bear put up, uh, there are genes, uh, multiple genes that regulate growth. And depending on which genes are broken, there are many pathways to roam, many ways to convert a normal cell into a malignant cell. And depending on what pathway has been taken, that is what's driving that particular tumor. And therefore, one size fits all isn't the right approach. You need to tailor the therapy to that uh, alteration. And that really is what's changed a lot about how we think about it. And that sounds very logical now, but I, I have to tell you, it was a, a pretty major change in thinking in oncology uh, just a few decades ago. Uh, and that really has brought us to where we are today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, uh, any uh, thoughts to add about uh, precision therapies in uh, adult oncology? Uh, with small molecules. And then I'd also like to ask you, what does this have to do with the immune system? We've heard a lot in the past several months about the ability of immune-targeted therapies to eradicate cancers. Uh, are they different approaches? Do they intersect in some way? And what does that uh, offer for the future of patients uh, with cancer? So I've been a medical oncologist for 25 years, and I've been able to see the whole evolution of this revolution in, in medical oncology. Um, as leading field in melanoma sarcoma, we were able to show very early on that one gene, in this case a gene called BRAF, was a gene responsible for half of all melanomas. The discovery really made only seven or eight years ago in the field of medical oncology. Talk about the history of oncology, it's a very short amount of time where these historic events have been discovered. And once you have a gene, in the case melanoma, now we have a drug, not just one drug, but two drugs that block this gene called BRAF. And actually you can get unbelievable 
responses, both partial and complete responses, which when I started my field of oncology many years ago was just not possible. Uh, same thing in a field called sarcoma, um, <coughs> a disease which we don't have great therapies, but in fact there's 60 different diseases which we would have called one disease at a given time. So with precision medicine, we've made, made great strides going forward. Now, as far as immunotherapy go, goes, as far as my field of melanoma, I've been able to see the evolution of new targeted immunotherapy drugs. Um, it wasn't unusual as an oncologist to, for a patient to come to see me and say, Dr. Schwartz, here are 20 different bottles. Which of these bottles can activate my immune system? I go through them all, and you know, really none of them, in fact, would, but it was a discussion we always had with our patients. We still do sometimes. But about seven, eight years ago, someone uh, came up with the idea that, began to ask the question, why is not our immune system turned on? What, what is it about our intrinsic immune cells called the T cells that have them off? In fact, there are diseases, medical diseases, where immunity is on all the time. Uh, they're called autoimmune diseases, uh, lupus, uh, ulcerative colitis. What's interesting about those, can those diseases, normal, non, non, non malignant can diseases, is that those patients don't get cancers. So why is that? Well, there's, on their cell, their T cell, they have activated immunity. So a fellow named Jim Allison uh, went ahead and, and actually found that on the T cell, this immune cell, there is a switch that's off. It's off in every one of us. It's part of our nature, natural innate ability not to have immunity on all the time. Now, why is that? If our immunity was on all the time, our own body would be finding our no own normal organs. And we'd all have autoimmunity and it would be a big problem. So Dr. Allison discovered on the T cell the switch. The first one was called CTLA-4. And he then found a drug that actually turned on the switch. And by turning on the switch, for the first time in medical oncology, we saw diseases go away that were completely untreatable before, including melanoma. Now, unfortunately, as you can imagine, with the first switch being activated, we had a lot of off-side effects, a lot of toxicity, because we're creating a field of autoimmunity in the patient. So now we have a second target called PD-1. And PD-1 is more tumor specific, not this global immune target that activates all of immunity. And in the last several years, we have now not one, but two drugs that actually turn on the PD-1 switch. And now again, we're getting unbelievable responses in melanoma. And now we have actual activity in many other cancers. In fact, you can think, Immune therapy is increasing to everybody. It's not unique to melanoma, sarcoma, lung cancer. It's an intrinsic part of our own body, our own innate, innate immunity. I, I have a slide, actually. I, we can go to the slide. So this is a patient, actually, with, um, with lung cancer on your, on your left. And what I'm showing you is a PET scan. Now, a PET scan uh, shows the activity of the cancer. So every spot is the energy that cancer has. It's not a CT scan or MRI scan where you measurements of size. We're looking at intrinsic energy of the cancer. This is a patient with lung cancer who's treated with a PD-1 inhibitor, that switch that's off. By using this drug that blocks PD-1, we turn the switch on. Immunity gets turned on, and now you can see what happens. The energy's gone. The energy's gone because the cancer cells are dead. This patient's in remission with a metastatic lung cancer. And just last week, this drug was approved for the treatment of lung cancer. So we're beginning to see an evolution that expands all of oncology, not just melanoma, lung cancer. You're going to see advances in head and neck cancer, bladder cancer, renal cancer, breast cancer, urological malignancies. It's just beginning, and I can't begin to say, sit back. You're going to see an amazing time in oncology. Immunotherapy is here. Is going to transform us as much as we tra have transformed personalized medicine. Now, I don't want to take too much time on this. I can talk. Is you know, I, I see if I. I can tell that. I, I can. I'm excited. I can. I'm excited. Uh, um, just one one last comment. So, integrating immunotherapy with gene therapy. Okay, this is the next big. Can we bring it together? Well, it turns out in a paper published just last week in Science by one of our actual investigators at Columbia, the new discovery is that the, the cell itself. That's background DNA, which we thought was nothing. We call the missense, nonsense DNA. That DNA actually seems to be the DNA the tumor cells uses for the immune system. And we're going to hear more about that background DNA that we thought was nonsense DNA as a critical part of the immune system and what the, t the tumor cell uses to actually protect itself from being recognized as foreign. So we're going to hear more about that coming for big breakthrough news on oncology. Bring together genomics 
immunotherapy for the first time. Thanks, Gary. We've been talking uh, in the past few minutes about uh, the impact of genetics and immunology and cancer treatment. But I think as everybody uh, in the audience knows, one of the major issues of our time in the field actually is who doesn't need treatment? We don't want to overtreat uh, individuals. Uh, we want to pick out the patients who need treatment and those who don't, and then tailor therapy or observation depending upon their own circumstance. And uh, I have the pleasure of um, being able to ask Dr. Corey Badi Shen about her own work in this field because I think it's very exciting and is a harbinger of where we're going. Corey. Thank you. I, I, I want to say that I remember that colonoscopy, and I cannot, I remember watching it, and I cannot imagine how many lives that this saved. The um, bringing to bear the awareness and the importance of cancer screening, I think, has been transformative. So now, 15 years later, we're at, a, we're at a different juncture. We're at the point of being able to identify many cancers at a very early stage in colon, in prostate, in breast, and now in lung, and presumably in many other cancers along the way. And so now we have a different problem. The problem is, who, who do we treat and who do we not treat? Now, this may seem like an embarrassment of riches, but in fact, it's not. Because if we treat too many patients, or if we don't identify the patients that we really need to treat versus those that don't need to be treated at all, and in fact, it can be quite detrimental to live with the kind of uh, uh, you know, treatments that uh, come to bear, then we're in a different position of being you know, forest through the trees. Which are the patients that we need to identify? And so using a team-based approach, and I think you know, this is another thing that I think is a very important concept that your video brings to bear and also the Stand Up to Cancer effort brings to the front line, is how important it is for us to work in teams across disciplines, together, collaboratively, to tackle these very big problems. And so my team that I'm here representing um, uh, has brought into the picture genetic approaches, systems biology approaches, uh, medical oncology, urology, uh, system, um, and, and molecular biology to try to understand which prostate cancers have to be treated aggressively and immediately, and which of the many, many men would benefit from not being treated at all. And so we developed a test that uh, we're excited to be developing right now, in which we um, have, uh, it's a very simple test, in which we can look at biopsy samples and use immunostaining approaches to identify the, t t the cancers that are uh, aggressive versus those that are essentially harmless. And by d in, in, using this approach, we hope to be able to take the information from having early detection, early screening, and to be able to hone in on those patients that need to be treated aggressively while not harmlessly, harmfully treating those that don't. And I think this is going to be a very important approach that we've taken in prostate, but will probably be used in many other types of cancers to really get at the, the, the heart of it. And, and I've called this a precision prevention, in fact. So. Corey, uh, is this just an approach you're thinking of developing or working? Uh, have we you actually, tested it? How does it work? We actually have uh, 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 two uh, complementary biomarker panels. So there's the good biomarkers, and you want those. And then there's the bad biomarkers, and you don't want those. So a really good cancer has a lot of, this is actually staining what you're seeing here. So the good cancers have the, the good biomarkers, and, the, and they don't have the bad biomarkers. And the flip side is the reverse. And in this very simple on-off test, uh, we should be able to do that. Right now, we're testing this. We've uh, we've uh, introduced these, uh, uh, this approach, and we're testing it now. Uh, and hopefully in a few years, this will be a test that many men will be able to have access to. Please let me know. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Nelson, I wanted to ask you, because you've been involved in the Stand Up to Cancer efforts, and you've been involved in many aspects of the treatment of cancers, uh, immunology, genetics. Tell us about teams. 
Uh, how important is it that uh, groups work together both in institutions and between institutions? Because uh, we're at this key juncture right now. Well, I, I have had the privilege to work with these remarkable women in Stand Up to Cancer, and I have to say, Katie, I am incredibly happy that I remember your colonoscopy much more clearly than my own. <laughs> but uh, one of the remarkable things about this documentary is as we look at the history of cancer, so vividly described in prose and now on film, you can't listen to, you can't read this, you can't watch it without thinking about the future. It amazes me that thinking about history drives you to think about where we're going so passionately. And that's what these women in Stand Up to Cancer were all about. You saw the beginning of our understanding of the first gene that when corrupted and defective might lead to cancer. And of course now we understand that cancers are fundamentally disorders of acquired defects in genes. What's interesting going forward is that we now understand there are also acquired defects in gene function. Perhaps as many as a thousand of the 25,000 genes aren't available for use by the cancer. It's put them in cold storage. It's done something to, to, to render them unavailable to protect the cancer cells against the, their sheer abnormality. And uh, we call this cancer epigenetics. And what's exciting moving forward is because of the advances made in cancer genetics, we now have tools to study epigenetic corruptions, and they're beginning to be the, the first glimpses of how we might treat to restore gene function. One of the teams, the really forward-looking teams from Santa Fe Cancer, was an epigenetic stream team, which delivered these kinds of treatments, and it couldn't have happened without this coordination and collaboration across many researchers at many institutions. I'm still disappointed that to, to have my role in Stand Up to Cancer on their scientific co-chairs, I had to be fired from that team because I very much aspired to be on it. But uh, this epigenetic stream team has also driven us to begin to ponder just what Dr. Schwartz is talking about. Can we use epigenetic treatments along with these new immune checkpoint inhibitors? Looks like there's great promise there. There's great promise. I don't think you can watch this film without seeing it. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can tell from uh, each of our panelists that we're all very excited to be at this uh, time in cancer research and treatment. There are amazing strides being made, and it's just beginning. Uh, I would open the floor to questions from our, our audience. If uh, uh, any uh, visitors from the press have questions they wish to ask about these or any other issues, uh, now's a great time. Uh, so. I think there's a circulating microphone. Please. And please identify yourself. Yes, I'm Jacqueline Egan. Um, I was going to ask the panel, uh, you talked about the multidisciplinary approach, uh, certainly on the academic uh, and uh, large institutional settings, but how does that come to play in the community uh, with some of these uh, uh, testing and biomarker testing and the targeted therapies? Uh, what are you seeing in the community with uh, multidisciplinary uh, approaches and testing for some of these genes? Gary, want to take a crack at this? Yeah, I think um, there are certainly are abilities now to do these types of uh, DNA analyses in the community. There are foundations that are, a, uh, there are you can pay to have these tests done. Uh, a day will come everybody will need this done, whether you're in an academic center in a major city or in the community. Every patient, as part of their initial diagnosis, just like doing a physical examination, a chest x-ray or a CAT scan, part of that evaluation will include sequencing of the DNA, understanding the nature of the biology, and finding the drugs that match that tumor. In fact, there's going to be a national effort um, starting the next several months under the uh, direction of Dr. Varmus to screen several thousand patients across the United States, community centers, academic centers, and there will be 20 to 30 clinical studies available in which the DNA signature will match the drug and patients will be able to enter these trials across the country. It'll be the first attempt to nationwide academic and community embrace targeted medicine therapy, personalized medicine therapy for every patient in the United States. It's a major effort, huge financial support by the federal government. Uh, we're participating, every cancer center and community center can participate. So to answer your question, I think this has to be part of the community-based approach. We're reaching out to the community to make it happen. Our goal is to sequence, sequence every patient with cancer. It has to be done. It's highly informative, gives information how to treat. And without that information, I would say, in this day of modern age, with modern directed drug therapy, you're not giving the patient the full information they need to make an informed decision on drug treatment. 
Yeah, I should follow up on that by saying that uh, Dr. Kung talked about the strides that were made in pediatric cancer. Um, one of the causes for those strides was that almost every children, uh, child with cancer in America has been treated on a clinical trial at a cancer center for the last 30 years. Uh, the pediatric oncologists organized the entire nation, all the pediatricians, all the patients are referred in for initial diagnosis and at least for treatment planning. And that's made an incredible difference. We now, through the intercession of the National Cancer Institute, have the chance to do such a similar network of clinical trial opportunities in genomics for adults. And it will be the only way for us to make progress is for patients and their physicians community to take advantage of this, enroll those patients in the sequencing trials, in the immunology trials, and have their treatment planting and uh, be done centrally and then distributed. Any other questions? One in the back. Yes, in the back. If you have a drug specific for a tumor or a certain cancer, or you use gene therapy, um, how would you target that to the tumor or the specific cell? Does it have to do with how you deliver the therapy or the drug, or more the markers on the cell? For example, if it's skin cancer, you don't want to, you only want to get the skin in a particular area of the body. Does it have to do with drug delivery more or markers on a tumor or healthy skin cell? Uh, Denny? So <laughs> when you're delivering targeted therapy, we have a lot more options than we previously had uh, with, by virtue of the fact that there are markers on cells to which we can direct antibodies. And there's now new chemistry that allows us to conjugate toxins to those antibodies for a new therapeutic approach called antibody drug conjugates. So it's not just the antibody alone or the drug alone, but the fact that you've been able to combine them that allows you to produce a smart missile that will deliver it to where the abnormal cells are, depending on the markers on that cells. There are markers, as, as Gary's pointed out, that we want the immune system to be able to recognize as well. Uh, and it's an idea of how we may be able to combine some of these therapies. So I think the horizon of how we do it and the technology we have available to us to do it has really exploded just in the last five years. So you're going to be seeing a lot more of this. But the idea is to target to what's broken in the tissues that are broken and allow normal tissues to be left alone. Uh, thank you very much for filling out uh, cards. If you had questions, I'm going to uh, uh, read a few of these and ask our panelists to answer them. So this is completely off scripted, so you should enjoy this. Uh, <laughs> the first question is, how rare are near total success stories in the treatment of cancer, like the so-called Philadelphia chromosome? And are these stories in the film? Sid, because um, it's, you know, your film. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you really look across cancers, we already heard some evidence. Uh, they're really not rare. Uh, they used to be rare. They're becoming less and less rare, and they're progressively not rare at all. We see in our clinical practice uh, near total success, what's been called near total success stories. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, the, the, the time that it took from the identification of the BRAF mutation to the development of the first uh, therapies against BRAF was about three years. Um, this it was unthinkable a decade ago. You could not imagine going from cancer to gene to targeted therapy in the course of three years. And, uh, and you know, the entire ecosystem had to change. And, and everyone's part of that, the change of the ecosystem, all the way from important patient advocates who had wanted this for a long time to change the ecosystem so that we don't keep the brakes on the ecosystem. Cancer has enough brakes already. So we, we can't keep the brakes on our ecosystems that will support the development of new, new therapies. Um, and so everyone changed around it. We brought that, not, as a community, brought that drug. Um, and really, we were following the example in pediatric oncology where you saw Again, and, you know, the so-called so near total successes reaching 70% or 80% of the patients uh, with a combination of various strategies, including now targeted therapies. So I think they're not rare anymore. Um, we just need to keep moving. Um, and, and the technology has to keep moving. The science has to keep moving. And we need all the advocacy efforts that we can get to keep, keep, that, keep that going. Gary, perhaps you want to comment about the progress in melanoma? 
recently? So, yeah, so for melanoma, the, as Sid's saying, with the identification of the BRAF mutation, it was really a historic discovery on the, on the change of targeted therapy. I guess the only thing I can add to that is that um, the human body is interesting, is that, and the cancer cell is interesting. So with these targeted drugs, we always have to stay a step ahead. And what I mean by that is that the tumor cell has a way of actually developing resistance to the drugs. That's now the next big challenge is how do we overcome drug resistance? Because we think we're smart, we identify the gene, BRAF, we find a drug, there are two, hits the gene, cancer cells die, patients go into remission seven, eight, nine months, but all of a sudden the disease comes back. When this first happened to me seven, eight years ago with some of the first patients I treated, it was a horrifying event. I saw CTs and PET scans like that, I thought, this is it, I can hang up my hat, I can give them my field, and then uh, I'm done. But it wasn't that simple, and life, of course, is never that simple. And there it was, eight months later, patients started coming back through current metastases. So it turns out that the tumor cell has survival mechanisms, um, and every cell seems to develop a survival mechanism against these drugs. So then we have to add another drug on top of it. We try to stay a step ahead. So now in oncology, we're trying to find what are the resistant mechanisms, what drugs we can add to drugs, to prevent the resistance from setting in? Can we keep extending that time interval where patients will benefit from targeted drugs and further advance the field of medical oncology? And that to us now is one of the true um, obstacles. We're, we're, we're learning how to deal with it. We're finding ways because the molecular biology, the science is showing us how to go forward in developing combinations to prevent that resistance which we're seeing. Question front. Uh, good morning, terrific panel. Uh, Ron Winslow from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm wondering how you see uh, the power of the science changing the mechanism, the dynamics of clinical trials. Um, um, where you have, I mean, phase one trials are now, um, you're finding significant efficacy where you used to only look for a, uh, you know, one or two, or, or, or five or ten percent hit. And um, it just seems to me that there's pressure on the conventional way the trials are run that the science is uh, putting on? Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity. Uh, and I'll start and then I'll turn over to uh, our other panelists, uh, Ron. If you think of uh, Dr. Bhatti Shen's uh, five gene panel, where if three of those genes are on, you m may not need treatment at all, but if two others are turned on, then you will need treatment. Already, if you design a clinical trial which only targets those patients who need treatment at all, your chance of getting success sooner is much higher because you don't lose the signal and the noise. And that's the incredible power of uh, being able to uh, parse different apparently similar looking tumor types into very different buckets where the genetic causes are different. It means the chances of seeing uh, benefit when it's going to exist are much higher in a much smaller percentage of patients much smaller number of patients, and I think we're going to make progress much, much sooner if patients enroll on the clinical trials nationally that distribute them to the right buckets. So this becomes a communications effort on our part, uh, as well as a scientific effort on the part of the people who do the genetics and design the clinical trials. Other thoughts, Bill, on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're spot on in, in your view of how we're going to change the way we do clinical research in cancer medicine with these empirically discovered drugs Right? We, we knew that they killed cancer cells. That was pretty much all we knew. They all had the same property in uh, cancer cells on a dish. The more the drugs you put on, the more cancer cells you'd kill. So the clinical exercise became how much could you give someone uh, and could you give it enough to kill cancer cells in the person without doing terrible damage. And that era of people who participate in these clinical trials is amazing to me. Where you have people with no other treatment options would participate in the old phase one trial the goal of which was to find the maximally tolerated dose and the dose limiting toxicity, 4% chance looking back, 5% at most of any meaningful benefit. I actually saw one of the very first people to get the drug Paclitaxel marketed as Taxol. She had a tremendous response, no one else did. And now with these new targeted drugs, we're only treating people who can expect to have a benefit we're going to use the dose to the dose needed to cripple this defect, the, the defective enzyme, uh, or, or whatever is the result of the gene defect. So we're not asking the maximal dose, we're asking the maximally effective dose. 
and this much more efficient time, money, and the human costs of the people who participate in these trials is going to be very different, I think. So and I would say that you will meet some of these pioneers, not just the scientific pioneers, yeah. but the patients who pioneered these therapies on film. Um, because we wanted, to, we wanted to really highlight their stories because they participated as much in the process of bringing a medicine, uh, a medicine that will impact millions of people to, to life by sacrificing their own lives, taking risks that others wouldn't take. And you will meet them, and I, and I really wish that they would become uh, uh, sort of etched in our, in our national memory forever because their sacrifices are just as deep as other soldiers who fight for us in other places. I'm going to say one last thing, which is that you know we have tried as, as a group of, uh, as humans really, to counter every obstacle with a counter obstacle. We have countered every, when clinical trials were insufficient, we switched clinical trials around. We invented new ways of making clinical trials. When drugs caused resistance, we looked for new ways. We have met cancer point for point for point, and we will continue to meet cancer point for point for point. But that requires a participation, again, going back to the aid of clinical trials, that requires participation from everyone. This is, cannot be a one-sided project. This is your disease as much as it is my disease. It will affect my children as much as it will affect your children. Uh, we are all equally uh, uh, part of this story. And so unless we get help from everyone, it, we will not move this, this story forward. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're performing this task with, uh, with progressively depleted troops. Um, the, the, the national will, I think, has gone out from under us at a moment when the response is striking. And despite the fact that we have, as a community, changed the fundamental way we think about cancer, changed the fundamental practice of cancer meeting point for point for point, it is as if the will has been taken away from our whole effort um, because of a kind of anemic situation, both in funding and in, and in, and, and in, in research, uh, research dollars. We have now 20% less research dollars than we had before we knew very much about the cancer genome. We cannot do the transformative work that we will do if we do not get the resources, and these are not big resources, to do the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, a, a graduate student in my laboratory wants to leave science. Uh, the other day I heard of a story of a graduate who wants to leave, leave science so that he can work for a company that enables us to get taxis better. That is disruptive technology. I mean, it's, it, we, are, we are living in an era of madness in which we have taken truly disruptive, transformative technologies and cheapened them. And we just can't do that anymore. Uh, we'll ask. Thank you, Sid. I want to follow up on that uh, and get the panel's thoughts on one question that came from the audience, uh, which has to do with the potential dearth. Um, with Corey's uh, exception, the rest of us are getting old on the panel. And so um, we need to train the next generation of physicians and scientists who can carry on the fight when you know, we're not able to. How do we do that? This is a complex field. Uh, you heard from Dr. Maniotis about trying to get a whole university involved. Any thoughts on what it's going to take to inspire the next generation of future physicians and scientists to work themselves and together, and how should we train them? I take that. Corey. Yeah, so I'm, as you know, very committed to training and very committed to the next generation. And I think here, again, this is a community effort, and um, we need the buy-in from the community uh, to be involved and to be excited about what we do. I think it was it's really exciting that all of you are here and excited to hear about what we do. I hope the, the I think the, the Sid's marvelous book brings mu very much to the table the important problems and the complexities and how motivated we all are. And so I think that uh, we can set the example from really getting, uh, educating people at all levels um, from the high school level. I think that's a great place to start, uh, even from the grammar school level. In fact, um, we can have people understand what cancer is and uh, why it's so important to study. And I think naturally, I would hope naturally that with that kind of motivation, our students, our postdocs would want to stay in science 
rather than work for camp companies <laughs> because I think that this is really where the benefit is. And, you know, I always tell my kids, I can wake up in the morning and I can look myself in the mirror and I can be excited and proud of what I do. And I think conveying that is a very, very important thing, so. Okay. Uh, one, uh, I'm looking through potential questions from the audience and one thing which struck me is there's been, um, not confusion, but there's been a duality of reference to what we're talking about. And as you know, the term precision medicine has been utilized, so it's personalized medicine. And uh, I think uh, the difference was enunciated most clearly uh, recently by someone who pointed out that all good medicine is personalized, that uh, we may be precise in our diagnoses and in the therapies we offer, but we're taking care of people. And we want to take care of every individual as if they're our sibling or our parent. Um, so one of the questions that came up from audience is how does um, palliative care uh, fit into um, our work? We don't cure every patient. How do we maintain the right relationship with all of our patients? And more speculatively, is there any way in which these sorts of um, personalized precision approaches will actually even impact palliative care and symptom management? Uh, thoughts from the panel? Dr. Schwartz, I see you. Well, it's an thinking. excellent question. Um, clearly, one thing we can't lose track of with the field of personalized medicine and the science of medicine is a humanism of medicine. I mean, that's, that can get lost in this big picture. We talk about the science, but behind the science, there's a patient who comes to us for specialized care. And we have to always be in touch with that patient and their own emotional needs and, and, the, and the psychosocial needs of that patient. It's a complex thing being an oncologist. It's not just being taking care of the, the gene or the pathway or the immune system. We're taking care of a, a person. And that person we have to be part of, become, not just part of that person's day-to-day -day life, but we become almost part of their family. And this extends not just from the time we can treat them to the time, but to the time they die. And it's, it's a unique relationship between the oncologist and the patient. I don't, I don't think it exists in any other part of medicine. Um, and that, I guess, is why people come to oncology. You have to have special personalities. And if you can't relate to the patient, you probably shouldn't be a medical oncologist. That being said, the evolution of how we take care of patients who have advanced cancers has evolved greatly and are becoming more in tune to the needs that are unique and special. Um, Clearly, we have to do better on allocating resources to the, to the pain process. I think uh, there are whole programs now built around pain and palliative care. Uh, each of us have cancer centers where there are whole programs where the specialists are being trained just how to, how to manage cancer pain. Cancer pain is still a big problem. Patients have it all the time. A lot, many of them do. And how to do that, how to, how to take care of those patients with appropriate drugs and pumps and new sophisticated technology is becoming part of our practice, but it requires specialists and money allocated to training of people who are physicians in, in pain care. How to deal with the dying patient is, a, is an ongoing issue. I mean, we find that patients are getting chemotherapy within the last two weeks of their life. It doesn't make any sense. We don't know how, to, as doctors, to deal with a dying patient. It's going to require an education, how to re-educate ourselves, how to talk to a patient, relate to them, and have us understand how they feel rather than continue to treat to the moment they're about to die. So I think it's a great question, Steve. I think we have a lot to learn about palliative care. I think we're making great strides. I think money is being invested. People are being trained in it. But as doctors, we still need to do better about how to understand that part of our practice. We can't treat to the very end. Uh, we have to learn how to, how to deal with that part of the patient's cancer life. As Thanks, Carrie. Well. Any more questions from our colleagues from the press? Oh, Katie. You know, first of all, thank you all for what you do. Uh, we're so grateful for your intelligence and commitment. And all these targeted therapies sound incredibly exciting. But what strikes me is the toxicity has uh, is still an issue. You know, I used to call chemotherapy sort of a scorched body approach, where you kill everything, hoping the healthy cells will grow back and the cancer cells will die. Where are we in terms of sort of these? more elegant targeted therapies, these kind of heat-seeking missiles who are, that remain missiles and, and are so destructive because I'm very interested in the field of secondary cancers actually caused by the treatments mm -hmm. and other medical maladies that surface because of the successful, often successful cancer treatments. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about that or if there's any exciting developments 
in those arenas. Maybe, Denny, you could address Denny? that. Yeah, there certainly are, uh, Katie. I think you're, you're on target. The concept behind the targeted therapy approach was that you would be treating what's broken in the cell that converted it, allowed it to convert from a normal cell to a malignant cell, and therefore hit its Achilles heel. Uh, and in theory, if you've done it right, normal cells don't have that Achilles heel. They don't have what's broken. So you should have a therapy that is A, more effective, and B, less toxic. Now, there's never a free lunch. There's always some toxicities with any drug taken to largest levels. But for many of the targeted therapies, that's precisely what we've seen. There's minimal side effects compared to what we're normally used to seeing as oncologists. There's uh, the ADC drugs we were talking about, the antibody conjugates, taking a drug like Herceptin and linking it to uh, the chemotherapy as opposed to administering it alongside the chemotherapy has made a big impact on safety in that women who are now getting that therapy no longer have the hair loss or the nausea, the vomiting, the, the problems that they had when we gave the antibody alongside chemotherapy as opposed to as an ADC. That's the first, I think, of many of these kinds of examples that'll happen, whether it'll happen again and again. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of excitement about the fact that we're gonna be able to not only dial up efficacy, but dial up efficacy while at the same time we dial down the safety concerns and the toxicities. And that's really the ideal of, of an ideally targeted therapy. I, I just wanted to add, Katie, as you know, one of the wonderful things that's been happening is we've generating so many more cancer survivors. They're accumulating 14, 15, 16 million or more. We have to think a lot about the precision medicine of cancer survivorship. Uh, Corey and I have been in the prostate cancer field for a long time, and it's wonderful. A man diagnosed today with prostate cancer, 97% of them or something are still alive five years later. The actual largest threat to that man's life today is diagnosed with prostate cancer is he might have a heart attack. Well, here's the, 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 the conundrum. One of our most commonly used treatments increases his chance to have a heart attack. That may not be the perfect way to use that treatment, and we're changing the way we use it by thinking about the whole person and how one person is different than another. And the incursion of these new technologies into that question is going to make this much easier to sort out, I think. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I, I would add that, you know, I think a lot of times when we think about sequencing and precision medicine, that is cast in the light of directing us to drugs that we can use or should use. But precision medicine is also uh, about knowing what drugs not to use. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, if it's the example, for example, that uh, Corey had brought up in, in terms of surveillance, um, knowing when to treat, when not to treat, but even in a patient who presents to us with cancer that we know we have to treat, I think the precepts of precision medicine uh, in our own experience has taught us that the information that we get uh, in some ca cases is very important in telling us not to give a particular type of toxic treatment because the data that we're getting tells us it's not going to work. And so, uh, and so I think precision medicine really has the potential to impact not only in terms of guiding where to go, but where not to go. Thank you. Sid, why don't you uh, wrap this up for us? Uh, it's been a great uh, session. Uh, I think we've given you a sense of the excitement of our field and where we're going in specific areas, uh, the incredible role of communications like this film in reaching uh, patients and families uh, throughout the nation to understand what we do for funding support and for uh, enrolling in clinical trials in the appropriate fashion. Uh, so here we are. Sid? I'm just going to take one last minute. You know, since the declaration of the war on cancer, um, we have needed uh, for the last four decades a report card. Um, a report card that says here is where we are, here is where we're going, and here, here's what happen, happens next. Uh, we have tried in, uh, in this film to generate that report card, um, and it's not just simply giving a grade, it is telling a story. It is telling a story that uh, combines every human resource, um, including every aspect of ingenuity, to direct against a disease that affects each and every one of us. I would just urge all of us to watch the report card, and if you are not moved by the ingenuity, if you're not moved by the resilience, um, uh, tell us what to do next. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.